Good morning, friends. Happy Easter to everybody. This is a strange Easter, but nonetheless, we are co connected via this uh, video link with each other, forming a community not only here in Somerset West, but wherever people are watching. The scripture reading is taken from John chapter 20, and is, we're going to read from verse 1. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw that the strips of linen were lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated there, where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this she turned and saw, the, saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Just so far. My friend Dion has been doing the park run in his backyard during lockdown. Yesterday he ran a half marathon in the same yard. It's only 50 meters in length. It's been exhausting watching him from my lounge sofa. There is a lot of running going on in John chapter 20. Mary is running to tell the disciples. Peter and John are running to see who gets to the tomb first. And then they run back to tell the other disciples what had happened. Running, running, running. The commentator Martin B. Copenhaver writes, When you look out at the congregation on Easter morning, not many of them will be breathless. Perhaps no one ran to get there. Although some may race to get a seat because the church will be fuller than usual. Clearly this was not written for a COVID-19 world. Somebody else wrote recently, um, the church is empty on COVID-19 Easter, but then so was the tomb. The Easter story is so familiar, but like the Jews with the Passover, we tell it every year. This is the first year I've not got to tell it in the usual way. I must tell it like this with a recorded message. Usually the words that I speak are surrounded by a number of other stimuli. The church is usually dressed up, purple for Lent, red for Good Friday, and then on Easter morning there is white. The great Easter hymns are sung, Jesus Christ is risen today, and of course, thine be the glory, risen conquering Son, endless is the victory, thou our death has won. The church is full and all are in a happy mood. There has been communion over the weekend, a foot washing perhaps, 
We may even have walked the stations of the cross or brought something forward on Good Friday to symbolize the laying down of our burdens. And then when we meet on Easter Sunday, even a simple retelling of the story is enough. Let's see if the story is still powerful, even though we are separated at this time. The first Easter we've not been able to celebrate together. There had never been a weekend quite like this one for those early disciples. They gathered on Thursday, why not Friday, to celebrate the Passover. Jesus then got up and to everyone's embarrassment re removed his outer garment, tied a towel around his waist and washed their feet. They had eaten. He had spoken. But his words were neither jovial nor festive. They were all about betrayal, death and being separated from them. There was, however, a vote of confidence. He said, I no longer call you servants, but friends. He had wanted to go out that night after supper to pray. And so reluctantly, with stomachs full of Passover food, and perhaps a glass too many of good wine, they fell asleep only to be awoken by a commotion. The temple guard with Judas in tow. They arrested Jesus. Soon there was an interrogation before the Jewish leaders, and then before the Roman governor, and then before Herod Agrippa, and goodness knows what other mocking and torture took place that night. On Friday, the whole world came tumbling down when Jesus, the hope of those who knew and loved him, became a victim, an object of judgment and an example for all who would provoke the great power of the Roman Empire. The result was death and a great big full stop. Now, this morning, something else is happening. The women were the first to the tomb, but they find the tomb open and empty. Who would be so cruel as to remove a dead body, and that on the day after the Sabbath? Peter and John were the next to arrive. They see the grave clothes there, but they're folded. This is different from the way it happened with Lazarus. He had to have the grave linen cut off. And so while Peter and John go back, we find Mary lingering. There are angels like the cherubim and the seraphim on the Ark of the Covenant. Is this the new holy of holies? The empty tomb? Is this where God has chosen to dwell? The story ends in an encounter with the risen Jesus. Mary hears her name. She can see that the gardener is in fact Jesus. Don't hold on to me, he says. She can't keep him with her the way he was. But in the process, she finds that he has taken hold of her heart. Why do you come to church for Easter services? Why are you playing this video message right now? Why do you and I feel drawn to this time and all that it symbolizes? Is it because we are looking for something? Is it because we want to hear something old? Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love? Is it because we want to hear something new? Maybe the old preacher will find something different this year. Maybe he has a new take on the Easter story. Something borrowed? Something blue? The German theologian Karl Barth said that what brings people to worship and not just on Easter, but on any day, is an unspoken question clinging to their hearts and minds. Is it true? Is it true? Is it true that God lives and gives us life? I've always wondered why so many people come to church only at Easter and Christmas time. I think it's the worst time to come. Those are the days that the church proclaims the hardest of all its beliefs, that Jesus died and rose again.
The teachings of Jesus and even some of his healings are so much easier to believe. But the resurrection? It may be hard to believe, but we believe it. Easter is also not the culmination of the story. It's not the grand finale of the story of Jesus. For the early church and for us, Easter is the opening act. It's the beginning. Our journey of faith begins at the empty tomb. I know the resurrection is hard to accept. Someone come back from the dead? It was hard for the first disciples and the people of Jesus' day. Remember John 12 verses 10 to 11. They wanted to kill Lazarus. It was an embarrassment to have a man raised from the dead walking around. There is a lot to doubt. And on Easter Sunday, and I know that more and more for this generation, it will be hard to believe. I want you to know that it has been hard for many of us. And for many people in the past, it has been hard as well. Emily Dickinson once wrote, We both believe and disbelieve a hundred times an hour, which keeps believing nimble. There was always something in the story to doubt. There was always something in the story that reached the deepest regions of their hearts and minds, where doubt and faith can be found. God gave us such a miracle of love and forgiveness that it is worthy of faith. The very doubts we had attest to the scale and power of what we are being asked to believe. Easter is too mighty for certainty, but too wonderful to have been invented. I'm sure that you're so sick and tired of COVID-19 advice. You've been told what you can do and what you can't. You've been told where to, you can go and where you can't. You can wash your hands without even thinking. And this message is not about that epidemic. It's about much, much more. God has made a way for us. Death is not a full stop. It's an ellipsis. There is more. Come on in. As pastors, we kind of hope that our parishioners leave worship on this day and they will have exchanged their question marks for exclamation points. But a question is a good and fitting place to begin. And so, dear friends, I wish you all a happy Easter. Can you see my bed socks, Bevan? Come in.